Good afternoon. For this session, I will be discussing a practical approach to hypertensive emergencies. Our learning objectives are at the end of this particular lecture, we should be able to recognize hypertensive emergency and its target organ damage and improve, but uh, in terms of control, there's still much to be desired. Now that probably goes hand in hand with that, wherein we know that uh, there can be uh, uncontrolled BP with very high labels, and that's how we define emer hypertensive emergencies, where e there is always a accompanying acute hypertension mediated organ damage requiring immediate BP reduction. And let me introduce these key target organs known as BAR, meaning the brain, the arteries, retina, and kidney, and the heart. And with that, there is an algorithm wherein, because of a grade three arterial hypertension, there will now be evidence of uh, hypertension mediated organ damage in these uh, organs stated, especially like the brain where you can have a stroke or hypertensive encephalopathy. You have your all important uh, acute aortic syndrome or preeclampsia or help in your arteries. You can have your retinopathy, grade three and four with the retina, and of course, acute renal insufficiency or thrombotic microangiopathy insofar as the kidneys are concerned and the all important acute heart failure and pulmonary edema as far as the heart is concerned. And then this now goes into hypertensive emergency where a rapid blood pressure reduction with IV drugs uh, chosen according to BARC is at hand. Now, of course, all important, we'll be still doing a quick medical history. And basically, these uh, patients have pre-existing hypertension. We talk about its onset and duration of symptoms. And definitely, we have to know the potential causes. And one, one of the more common ones should be non-adherence to antihypertensive drugs, lifestyle changes, and of course, concomitant use of BP elevating drugs like steroids or NSAID, your sympathomimetics, and even cocaine, which of course uh, would uh, also lead to hypertension. <clears throat> and uh, the clinical presentation is determined by which organ is acutely affected. And the symptoms will vary from headache, visual disturbances, chest pain, dyspnea, neurologic symptoms, dizziness, and other nonspecific presentations. So the all-important hypertensive acute heart failure because of the uh, rapid onset of uh, pulmonary congestion uh, in the setting of a systolic uh, pressure of 140 millimeters mercury and often greater than 160 millimeters of mercury, uh, acute heart failure is precipitated by rapid and excessive increase in your arterial BP, uh, typically manifested as acute pulmonary edema. And uh, as you would uh, see here, uh, the heart actually bears the burden of target organ damage in hypertension, wherein the increase in systolic BP could lead to myocardial hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy, and even impaired diastolic function, in which case this is also a common cause of acute heart failure. So in that particular scenario, we now have to have a prompt reduction in blood pressure, considered a primary therapeutic target and initiated as soon as possible. And in fact, this aggressive blood pressure reduction in the range of 25% should be done during the first few hours and cautiously thereafter. And we have to use intravenous vasodilators in combination with loop diuretics. Now this will just list down IV vasodilators used to treat acute heart failure and uh, you are very familiar with this, the uh, nitroglycerin brip and even the isosorbide dinitrate brip, which is the isoket brip. Now we just have to know the dosing as, as shown here. And of course the main side effect would be your hypotension and your headache. And in the case of nitroproside, your isocyanide toxicity. So, and for that matter, uh, this patient should be monitored very closely for hypotension. Now, the other uh, important consideration would be that of an acute coronary syndrome. The increased systolic blood pressure leads to myocardial hypertrophy, LVH, and impaired diastolic function. And likewise, diminished relaxation 
decreases coronary perfusion pressure and can lead to ischemia and myocardial infarction. Go to the to the uh, schema on the right side of the screen. Take note that the reason why hypertension is closely related to acute myocardial infarction is because the the key uh, risk factors are actually shared together by this uh, disease. And in the in the middle portion, take note about uh, the role of endothelial dysfunction. And we all know that hypertension would definitely accelerate atherosclerosis. Hence, I, uh, this would also lead to acute myocardial infarction. And of course, another very important uh, 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 disease would be your acute aortic syndrome. So this will be in terms of your aortic dissection and intermural uh, hematoma and atherosclerotic ulcers. Now, it is actually the high BP values that would be the driving force towards a fatal outcome in these acute aortic syndromes. And it's actually your uncontrolled hypertension, which remains the most significant treatable risk factor. And of course, a high index of suspicion is useful to guide diagnostic evaluation. Uh, immediate management in this case is very important and blood pressure reduction. So as mentioned, uh, this is a uh, very little and uh, fatal if not recognized. So never forget the possibility that there can be an acute aortic syndrome in a patient uh, having hypertensive emergency. And of course, again, one of them would be malignant hypertension. And this is usually in patients with very high elevations of blood pressure of about more than 200 to 120. And they would have advanced retinopathy defined as bilateral presence of flame-shaped hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, or papal edema. And in fact, we all know that uh, often than not, we probably are missing doing a fundoscopic exam, which is an essential step of the examination. And what we usually see in malignant hypertension would be a grade three retinopathy, uh, which speaks of uh, your flame shape hemorrhages and cotton wool spots, if I have to repeat. And of course, papilidina, which is a grade four retinopathy. And again, uh, let me just remind you that fundoscopy is an essential step. Now, probably something that uh, is not really well uh, elucidated would be a, uh, also a thrombotic microangiopathy. Uh, this is a situation where severe BP elevation coincides with a Coombs negative hemolysis, wherein you can have elevated LDH levels, uh, unmeasurable haptoglobulins, and or your histocytes, which are basically uh, RBCs uh, that are damaged. And uh, of course, thrombocytopenia would happen in the absence of another plausible cause and with improvement during BP lowering therapy. Meaning to say, if you look at the uh, uh, schema on the right side, there are three triangles that you see. The one is the one on the left is your blood pressure related uh, uh, complication, and in the right will actually be your other uh, thrombos uh, thrombocytopenic situation, wherein it will more speak of your thrombocytopenic uh, uh, purpura. And that would mean that uh, it will be of another disease entity. And in between would be your complement dysfunction. Uh, the, the next slide will further clarify the differential diagnosis between these two conditions of uh, your hypertensive emergency and your uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And it's actually your fundoscopic examination that would uh, define your uh, hypertensive emergency in the presence of your hit wagner barker stage three and four fundoscopic examination. Likewise, in terms of thrombocytopenia defined as uh, less than 150, uh, usually present, but seldom severe. But in uh, TTP, it's usually severe, uh, less than 30. Likewise, uh, your damage uh, is schistocytes or uh, w, uh, RBC in the peripheral blood smear would be invariably present in your thrombotic thrombocytopenic corpora. And likewise, your uh, Adam's 13 activity is normal in your uh, hypertensive emergency and very low in TTP. So this will also, its presence 
would actually be uh, absent in your hypertensive emergency and definitely present in terms of auto antibodies in acquired TTP and mutations in this particular enzyme in congenital TTP. Now, again, severe hypertension may actually present with seizures, lethargy, cortical blindness, and coma. In, and in the absence of an alternative explanation, this will be termed as your hypertensive encephalopathy. And in fact, this can lead to what we call uh, reverse posterior reversible leukoencephalopathy syndrome, wherein the, 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 ones that, the symptoms that I mentioned may actually be present and it will eventually lead to some uh, vasogenic edema in the posterior brain regions. Uh, focal neurologic lesions are very rare. And if we don't reduce the BP right away, this will lead to hemorrhages and infarctions and the patient uh, would uh, have more neurologic deficits. Now, overall, basically severe uncontrolled hypertension uh, would be uh, would increase your renal vascular resistance and would induce a pressure natriuresis and, of course, would lead to autoregulation failure. And that uh, natriuresis would definitely affect uh, or activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone activation, and that will actually go to microvascular damage and endothelial disruption. And uh, this will also be a feedback mechanism in terms of autoregulation failure. And in fact, this is the one that really uh, causes the organ damage in terms of the bark. So furthermore, when there's endothelial disruption, you have some endothelial tissue exposure, wherein now uh, you activate platelets and the clotting cascade in terms of thrombocytopenia, as mentioned, giving to your also dreaded thrombotic microangiopathy, which I discussed earlier on. So that's basically the pathophysiology initiated by a severe, uncontrolled hypertension. Now, we have heard about uh, mechanisms that uh, lead to loss of autoregulation. And uh, very important here, as you see, the normal brain tissue uh, in terms of autoregulation is the, is the dark, uh, the, the black uh, line here. And the dotted lines will speak of a hypertensive patient uh, the one in the middle would be a mildly ischemic brain tissue. And of course, down there with a very low cerebral blood flow, but with a high cerebral per perfusion, with a low per uh, with a high perfusion pressure would definitely be in terms of your moderately and severely ischemic brain tissue. Now, the hallmark actually of your hypertensive emergency is the loss of autoregulation. And that would mean that it will not only affect the brain, but also would actually affect the heart and even the uh, the eyes and even the kidney. So it's also a very important uh, process that is supposed to be taken care of. While that's why we have to control BP in the right manner. Now, diagnostic tests would be very important and essential. So we have to do a thorough physical examination, both cardiovascular and neurologic. But of course, don't forget uh, examination of the of the uh, eye grounds by way of your fundoscopy and ECG. Laboratory analysis will be dependent on uh, what you actually be, will be suspecting. Basically, uh, you need a hemoglobin, platelet count, creatinine, your electrolytes, your LDH, haptoglobulin, urinalysis for protein and urine sediment. Furthermore, of course, as recommended by the ISH 2020, optimal diagnostic test will be in terms of a clinical context. So if there's chest pain, you have to ask for a troponin, and there's uh, evidence of fluid overload and, con and congestion, then your chest X-ray is uh, needed. And of course, if you want to look into cardiac structure and, and function, your transthoracic echocardiograph as your cardiogram is called for. And if there's cerebral hemorrhage and stroke, your cranial CT MRI. If there's acute aortic disease, you have to do an immediate CT and even a CT angiography of both the thorax and abdomen. And if there is a, a suspect uh, post renal obstruction, looking into kidney size and left to right difference will be your renal ultrasound. 
Now, uh, it is said that secondary causes can be found in 20 to 40 percent of patients presenting with malignant hypertension, and the appropriate diagnostic workup to confirm or exclude secondary form is indicated. So again, uh, it depends on the clinical context. Uh, we don't have to do a uh, shotgun laboratory exam, but it should be honed into that particular index of suspicion. Now, applying the Burke algorithm, uh, as they say, time is life. And uh, a very quick identification of the underlying condition is important because appropriate treatment is vital. So just to give you an example, when there is a grade three high blood pressure, uh, or the, the BARP uh, approach would mean if you have to look into neurologic symptoms, and if there are, then you have to do your, your CT, you have to roll out your stroke. And of course, when uh, the CT is positive with a high BP, you have to consider intravenous drugs. And of course, and when you do have chest pain, you have to do your ECG, your troponin, you have to image the uh, aorta and coronary art arteries to identify the di dissection and or acute coronary syndrome. And if there's acute aortic disease, again, you have to consider intravenous drugs. Then again, in terms of the retina, the headache and visual impairment, if that is positive, you have to do a fundoscopic exam and search for your retinop uh, retinopathy. And of course, plus a brain CT scan. And if there's a, a ischemic stroke, you have to consider IV drugs to control the high blood pressure. And if you're looking at the kidney, if there's acute re, uh, kidney insufficiency, you have to look into LDH, cystocytes, platelet count, and search for microangiopathy. And if there's a thrombotic angiomyopathy, then you have to consider IV drugs. And in terms of the acute heart failure, uh, you just have to, in ACS, you have to work very fast. Again, this is another story. You have to consider IV drugs or adjust oral therapy. Then let me just go down to the last uh, part of this scheme, uh, schema. Take note that in so far as the brain, you have to bring down the BP to less than uh, 130 and also to less than 180, depending on the level. And you have to consider surgery. Okay, in terms of your acute aortic disease, you have to consider bringing down to less than 120. And also if there's ACF, you have to consider PCI. Then if there's again a uh, ischemic stroke, it's another story, you have to bring down to about 15% of your uh, mean arterial pressure, meaning less than 180, and consider your thrombolysis. When there's a thrombotic microangiopathy, you can go down to 20 to 25% of the map. Now, uh, for your for your heart, for acute heart failure and ACS, you have to bring down the BP to less than 180 or do, do a reduction of your map by le of less than 25%. So it's not a, a cure-all or treat-all, but it, it has to, to be dependent on what particular organ damage is ongoing. So it is said here that the type of target organ damage is the principal determinant of the choice of treatment, your target BP, and time frame by which BP should be lowered. So it's a tailored therapy. It's not a cure-all or treat-all uh, strategy. So this will just tell us the clinical presentation. It's basically a repeat of what I've said, but now... Uh, it gives us a also the timeline and target BP. So you see that in malignant hypertension, you actually, uh, the timeline is several hours, but again, uh, a, a mean arterial pressure of 20 to 25. Target BP uh, would be also very important. See here that in hypertensive encephalopathy, you have to act immediately. In acute ischemic stroke, within an hour. And of course, uh, that would also mean that uh, you can do your thrombolytic therapy insofar as your BP is uh, 185 or greater. If your BP is greater than 185 and greater than 110, then you have to bring down that BP within an hour. Now, the first line treatment, as you see on the third line, would actually be your nicardipine and labetalol. But unfortunately, labetalol 
has not been available well in the Philippines. So it's still your nicardipine as a fir first line treatment. Now, uh, the other things would be your uh, your acute hemorrhagic stroke and systolic BP of greater 180. You have again to, uh, the timeline is immediate and bring down that BP to less than 180. In acute coronary event, your uh, the, there should be immediate lowering and that would mean lowering to less than 140. That also is true for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now, for acute aortic disease, you have a lower uh, threshold, which is less than 120, and also lowering the heart rate to less than 60. Eclampsia and severe preeclampsia in your health, uh, you also would have to have an immediate blood pressure lowering to less than 160 systolic and less than 105 diastolic. Again, in terms of the first-line treatment, Basically, you're left with uh, your nicardipine in terms of your your heart and, of course, your pulmonary edema. You are uh, you have your nitroglycerin with a loop diuretic. And you talk about acute aortic disease, you can use your esmolol, uh, I think, which is uh, available, your nitroposide, nitroglycerin, or nicardipine. Let us just remind ourselves that the overall therapeutic goal is a controlled BP reduction to safer levels. Again, at different levels in, in relation to what particular hypertensive emergency is present to prevent or limit further hypertensive damage while avoiding hypotension and related complications. Because naturally, when we start giving this IV medication, the BP will have to be lowered. So again, uh, we have also to be very careful in targeting the BP that uh, has been uh, uh, elucidated. Now, intravenous drugs, uh, esmolol, your metoprolol, I think it's only esmolol, the, uh, a, a short acting, uh, look at the onset of action of these uh, beta blockers and combine alpha beta blocker. It, the onset of action is, is very quick. And the duration of action, as far as esmolol is concerned, is only 10 to 30 minutes. Whereas of metoprolol, which again, unfortunately, we do, I think we only have the oral form. Uh, the, of course, again, the contraindication for this beta blocker will be the presence of a second or third degree uh, AV block. And of course, systolic heart failure, your asthma, and bradycardia. Uh, of course, again, your nicardipine, I think, which has been... Uh, well uh, expand, expounded in, in, in all almost all the conditions that I have mentioned. This would be probably the most popular uh, drug preparation. The onset of action is 5 to 15 minutes. Duration of action is 30 to 40 minutes. So you have your uh, continuous IV infusion uh, with a dose of 5 to 15 milligrams per hour. Starting dose is 5 milligrams. You increase every 15 to 30 minutes with 2.5 milligrams until goal BP is achieved, thereby decreasing it to 2 to 3 milligrams per hour. So again, close monitoring is, of course, very necessary. Now, the contraindication is liver failure. Nitroglycerin, again, uh, it, when you use this in uh, your ACS, so it usually is also a very... Uh, early onset of action at one to five minutes, duration of action of three to five minutes. So after having said that, uh, I think basically we have to control the BP, uh, admit the patient, and a thorough investigation of potential underlying causes and assessment of your uh, organ damage. And of course, we have to adjust our, and simplify antihypertensive therapy. And of course, uh, educate our patient to improve adherence and have long-term BP control. If not, he will have another episode of hypertensive emergency. And of course, regular and frequent follow-up, uh, as much as possible, a monthly follow-up, is recommended until target BP and regression of your uh, hypertension-mediated uh, organ damage is achieved. In summary, I have shown you that uh, hypertensive emergencies have to identify by the presence of organ damage, which foretells life-threatening complication. Time is life. We have to uh, quickly assess the patient, 
and see what he really has and do the right uh, control of your BP. And of course, this is in relation to your BARC-based algorithm. A quick identification of hypertensive emergency is called for. And of course, uh, patients with hypertensive emergencies must receive immediate treatment in a proper manner. It's not a uh, treat-all strategy, but we have to individualize what hypertensive emergency patient you actually uh, are dealing with. And with that, let me thank you and have a good day.